I will now start the recording as you heard the, the voice, the machine voice. So thanks so much again and welcome um, for being with us at this time. So it's either good evening or good afternoon, depending where you are joining us from, or maybe even good morning, I'm not sure. Um, anyway, we are very happy to have you here. So my name is Laila Hajabdu, and together with my colleague Kudavashe Manjoro, I'm really delighted to welcome you to this roundtable and public discussion on the issue on rethinking knowledge politics in migration research and practice. So this roundtable comes at the very end of a long day for us, um, namely a one-day workshop on the very same issue, which Kuda and I organized on behalf of the African Center for Migration and Society at the University of Witwatersrand and the Department of Political Science at the University of Vienna in partnership with the African Research University Alliance and the Anti-Racism Working Group of the MISCO International Migration Research Framework. So, and as those of you who already joined us, we discussed already a lot during the day that especially in the last years, there has been um, what some of my colleagues like Marie Stiel, for instance, called the migration knowledge hype and the growing interaction of migration policy world and scholarship which in turn, but also increased the important reflexive turn in migration scholarship and teaching. And in these past two years, this reflexive turn was also complemented with a rise in claims for a decolonial approach and an emphasis on processes of racialization and their continuities. And we had the feeling that while this was and is an utterly important debate, genuine interactions, engagements from migration scholars, teachers and practitioners across the globe and across the North and South were missing in our understandings. Moreover, it has become difficult to differentiate genuine proactive decolonial agendas from reactive self-serving ones that simply maintain or reinvent the status quo. So in today's workshop, what Kuda and I set out and also this round, uh, round table, we want to create a space for such an exchange and critique by engaging with different sets of questions, which then Kuda will introduce and, and ask our uh, panelists. So really, I'm, I'm very glad um, that we have a fantastic uh, panel. I will not take lots of my time to introduce our panelists because I believe they don't need an introduction and we're much, much more interested in what they have to say. Um, so just for me, really a very warm welcome. We are extremely honored that you took time that you are here with us and that you share your insights um, on the issue. So maybe I hand over immediately, immediately to Kuda um, to introduce and to pose the three questions. Yeah, Th thanks a lot, Leila. And uh, thanks again to our speakers we, um, who agreed, who graciously agreed, particularly this time of the year, which is um, quite a tasking uh, time to, to, to come into this space and to engage around the three questions that we, we thought would be important to discuss. And we, we do have um, with us uh, uh, Tendai Achume, uh, Aurora Vegara, and Ipek Demir, who, are, um, um, who need no introduction uh, and for, for necessarily because of the work that they do around these questions around um, decolonization um, and, and also questions of sort of uh, transformation. And I, I think we also, uh, we are also blessed to have an all woman panel uh, which is really, um, which is really something that I think we we really like to see, and um, I think between Leila and, and and myself, we really were trying to find uh, sort of to have uh, people in the room who would be able as well, not only to talk about these issues, but to also represent them, so that um, you know the next generation of African scholars um, or. Uh, or, or, or whatever positionality one finds themselves uh, can also see uh, what 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 we envisaging and what that could look like. So, without much further ado, I'm going to start off with uh, an, a question that is really about thinking about the research agenda. So, we we are going to have uh, 10, 10 minutes. Uh, sort of allocated for each question. And 
I will allow each speaker to respond to a question within sort of three, uh, three to five uh, minutes before we then bounce back to Leila uh, for to moderate a sort of public discussion or a Q and A. So um, for Aurora, it's very nice uh, to meet you, and and I would really like to hear your take on this question around um, how we can, how how we can sort of um, think of a. Of framing a research agenda and also empirical analysis that avoids uh, perspectives or uh, categorizations as well as approaches that may end up sort of reproducing uh, injustices. So what, what could that framing or approach look like? And how could we realize that through uh, the different methods and, 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 and the work that we do in the field? Um, and, and, and I think the last uh, perhaps question to tie this together is, is there any potential to to um within the decolonial framework or a decolonial um, um uh, optic uh, to to think about these questions and address them and 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 if if also perhaps there are more limitations than than opportunities and and you could uh, feel free to take it in whatever direction you 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 would like as I know it's quite a very broad uh, question. Well, thank you. Thank you for the organizing of this event and the roundtable. Greetings, everyone. It is a pleasure for me to be a part of this conversation in such a great company and thinking about such thoughtful and profound questions. So it's an honor and I hope to answer to some of the points of the, that you have just made and we'll be happy to continue the conversation in any different space if the time is uh, not sufficient. So I would like to contribute to um, this roundtable um, with reflections from findings of a series of research projects that I have led in the last decade in Colombia, in Latin America, considering the limitations of the framework when we face long-term situations of land dispossession. So considering the questions about <clears throat> how can in and should a research agenda and empirical analysis that avoid perspectives, categorizations, and approaches that ultimately reproduce injustice it looked like and the potentials of the framework and the other aspect of your, of your questions, I would like to start by saying that it is a very complex task to consider a research agenda that ultimately challenges the reproduction of injustices because we have to consider that the universities from which we design these projects are one of the main places in which inequalities reproduce. So I would like to start by stating that we need to recognize that the institutions from which we are developing these projects, most of the, I, most of the time are contributing to the reproduction of, of these inequalities. And when we start thinking through those lens, um, we can see, for example, how the very existence of researchers um, that represent of that look like the population that they are studying, the very existence of these researchers is persistence, the very existence. Having them in these research groups, having them in these research institutions is one aspect of what we have to consider to start challenging the limitations in which we develop these research projects. So that's one aspect that we should consider. We also have to consider how the research themes look like. What is the budget that is allocated to develop this type of research? And also what are the topics, the intersections of ideas and variables, the methodologies that we um, choose to tell these stories. And mainly also, what is the time that is dedicated to the formulation, to formulating the research projects that we think will contribute to avoid reproducing injustices. I will argue that <clears throat> time is a, a very important aspect here in the formulation and development of this type of research agenda, because most of the time, our research projects, where we consider these topics or the main topics of this field, most of our research projects are very limited in time. Some of them are six months, one year projects, two years projects at most. The longest projects that I've seen take five years or a decade but it's not more than that. And when we consider time, we have to recognize that time is important because in this field of knowledge, we are challenging inequalities that have been present for centuries in society. And when we address these research projects, 
for a semester, a year or more or less, most of the time we are not able to reach the, the main goals that we are proposing for society. Most of our research projects are very limited in time. And even though, even though we have good intentions, frequently we do not uh, change the structural dimensions of what the research projects are, are pro uh, promising. And when we go deeper into this aspect of time, how the research teams look like, how the methodologies are developed, we need to take a very close look at the framework because that is a major, a major issue. <clears throat> Critical approaches to the field of forced migrations have concluded that the main concepts that we use to develop these projects, to study the populations that are victims of this um, phenomenon, do not consider time as an aspect, do not consider the history of these populations as an aspect. And the concept of, for example, the concepts of forced migration, forced displacement, that are very common on this field of knowledge, have been proven to be formulas for historical erasure. These concepts have been used to name populations such as the mm, survivors of the massacres, survivors of many events of violence, but so far, we have been able to prove that they are limited in their ability to contribute to the demands of reparation of the affected populations. However, we continue using them and we continue um, developing research projects using these categories that are limiting that are in the ability to explain what's happening with these populations. In, the, in my 2017 book, based on a long-term ethnography of pain and suffering, generating the survivors of a massacre, I propose the concept of deracination as a tool to study land dispossession. And this concept is a, aims to capture both local specificities and also global linkages of this phenomenon and the strategies of resistance used by the people and these communities that are the victims of this kind of a, events. But also this concept, I propose this concept to help us think um, through the many layers of many of what seems like an impossible morning. These populations are constantly victims of several events of violence for decades and for centuries. So when we take a very close look at the literature, most categories emphasize the coercive and otherwise involuntary character of the movement. So in the case of inter, um, international uh, internal displacement, the emphasis is in the fact that such movement takes place within national borders. In the case of the concept of refugees, the emphasis is in the fact that movements take place outside of the national borders. And most of the time, the categories emphasize the immediate and sometimes assume forced inducing movement, for example, conflict, development of disasters. So when we try to consider approaches that help us to move the agenda, including a more decolonial perspective, we need to see that these notions identify the external, the external force inducing the, um, the force dislocation of the population, but is doing it in a timeless fashion. And when it, when it does it in a timeless fashion, sometimes you don't, not, you, you don't, for example, you don't connect that the victims of those events today were are the descendants, for example, of former uh, populations that were enslaved or populations that were colonialized in centuries before or decades before. So it is important when we consider methodol methodologically how to develop this kind of type of research, we definitely need to take a look. Uh, take, we need to take a very close look at the <clears throat> historical processes that have taking place in these territories, it is very important to take a very close look at the voices of these communities. Our interviews are very powerful here to make sure that we address the ways in which these populations name themselves, name the experiences, name the processes that they are being the victims of. And when we do that, uh, we try to um, escape the way in which the current framework is leaving out the complexity of socioeconomic processes that have been uh, preceded, for example, by, in the case of Colombia, the armed conflict, situations of generalized violence, violation of human rights, or natural human-made uh, disasters. So most of the time we identify those cases as the cause of the problem, and we do not make sure that we connect this to um, phenomena and processes that have taken place 
uh, centuries before. So when we try to develop research agendas and empirical analysis that avoid perspectives, categorizations, and approaches that ultimately reproduce injustices, I will I, I will argue that it is really important that we had that we consider the time that we dedicate to these research projects, how we treat time and historical process as a variable in the analysis, and from that, how we make sure that this made its way into the um, designations of badges that are um, coherent with the um, problems that we are facing and at the same time the way in which we um, design the research groups that are going to take that are going to be part of this type of projects i'm going to leave my answer there so that i can yes. continue listening to my colleagues and building from yeah. there thank you Thank you. You gave us uh, quite a lot to work there. And Ipek, I wonder what your take is um, in terms of this uh, question about the research agenda. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you asked uh, us to rethink the migration research agenda and practice. I mean, thank you very much for the invite. And I should say that I want to start with a caveat. We have a strike here at universities in UK in 58 universities, we've had it since Wednesday, due to increased workloads, reduced pensions, gender pay gap, uh, which is usually about 20% in UK universities, and also casualization in higher education in UK. So I want to start by connecting this uh, strike to our conversation, decolonization. So I want to start by saying that we need to think through the relationship between marketization of universities and decolonization. And, and I want to therefore ask the question, can we really decolonize research and teaching in anything, including migration, in a neoliberal university? I think there is a tension there and an, an acknowledged, unacknowledged uh, tension, so which we can return to perhaps later. In terms of rethinking the uh, research uh, migration uh, uh, agenda, my argument in a nutshell is that we not only uh, does the field need to make better links between colonialism and migration and thus decolonization, but not having done so has in fact ended up reproducing methodologically nationalist understandings and methodologically nationalist migration research, a field whose very pre uh, premise was to go beyond methodological nationalism. And I will uh, make this point by uh, uh, going back to my field, which is diaspora uh, studies, which kind of I place within, of course, migration uh, uh, field. The field of diaspora studies, for example, despite its transnational premise and promise, has too often got trapped in methodologically nationalist perspectives, confining discussions of diaspora to nation-centric understandings and discourses. Methodologically nationalist approaches to diaspora typically see diaspora as emerging out of ethnopolitical struggles with the nation states and usually is viewed from the perspective of push factors. Yet, I argue that empires and colonization have to be central to understandings of movements of people, of migrations, especially of diasporas. This is because empires have governed various populations myriad ethnic, religious, cultural groups through plantations, indenture, colonization, expansion, settlement, slavery, and other forms of domination and movements of peoples, empires have in fact been instigators of diasporas. And in fact, many of uh, today's diasporas were made in and by recent empires, including the collapse of them and or the nationalist projects that followed from them. So if you think about the Ottoman Empire, Kurdish and Armenian diasporas, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Slavic and Jewish diasporas, British Empire, Afro-Caribbean and South Asian diasporas, or the French Empire, Arab or North African diaspora. So many of today's diasporas are thus an outcome of historic relationships arising out of subordination and colonization of expansion and retraction of empires. Yet diaspora research has too often ended up being too tightly hemmed into history, sources, and understandings of the nation state, of homeland, and uh, ideas about home. I'm not saying we should forget 
uh, notions of home, but it's too tightly hemmed uh, into this. And, uh, and I think this has happened despite many diaspora theorists, Brah and Gilroy Hall and uh, Cohen having discussed diaspora within the context of empire. So we need to kind of think about what, why did this perhaps happen? But the thing that I want to uh, quickly mention here is that, um, that this has kind of brought limitations to the field of um, diaspora, this ignoring uh, of diaspora. So the temporal limitations, Aurora talked about history and time. So I'm almost linking it uh, to that. And also uh, Ayesha Chalar earlier talked about uh, time. But the temporal lim limitation I'm trying to highlight here is that the links between empire and diaspora have more or less been erased in, in much of the research. Not all, of course. Secondly, spatial limitations we have in the field. The transnational reach of diaspora has ironically been curved. So the temporal limitations have actually curved the spatial potential, uh, in a sense, if we understand space and time as limited. Right. So, for example, how do you understand uh, um, a diaspora, a South Asian diaspora in the UK, if you don't understand the British Empire? Right. So the, the, the lack of the empire dimension has brought in uh, a spatial limitation on our understandings of the movements of empires. Uh, sorry, uh, diasporas. And uh, thirdly, confining discussions of diaspora uh, to the politics of their nation state and to the home. Uh, kind of uh, overly paying attention to this, I think has placed boundaries on diaspora citizenship and involvement and the challenges it has brought uh, in the new home, you know, leaving kind of a question mark over the extent to which they can really belong. So in a sense, approaches which ignore empires and colonialism, therefore, have reproduced the uh, assumption that the real home of diasporas remain elsewhere and that their nation state and the consequence that their citizenship in the new home is regarded as contingent and revocable. I can't say more about this, but I'll just remind people, I don't know if you're familiar with the Windrush uh, scandal uh, uh, that post-colonial court uh, immigrants, but they uh, actually were uh, British citizens uh, who came to uh, Britain in 1950s uh, uh, were um, kind of turned into immigrants in some sense. So even though they came to the mother country as Commonwealth citizens, uh, they were uh, uh, the linkages and lineages that were created uh, through empire were not recognized. And some of them were sent home because they were immigrants and nothing to do with Britain. So to challenge that uh, in Britain, um, some of the uh, diasporas in 50s, 60s, they used the phrase, we are here because you were there, making that kind of uh, spatial and temporal connections. I'll make one last uh, point uh, before uh, we move on. I think um, uh, research which ignores the colonial and empire axis of diasporas contribute to North-centric understandings of migration, diaspora, and ethnic diversity. Such understandings act as a justification for hard violent borders of the global north. And here I have in mind, of course, those refugees drowning in the Mediterranean, English Channel, or violence at the US-Mexico border or Belarus-Polish border more recently. So um, I'd like to um, stop now and maybe we can return to these later. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ipek. And I mean, that's a powerful quote. We are here because you were there and uh, cannot think of a better time to bring in our third uh, speaker, uh, Tindai, whom I think has much to add to that, um, um, to that register. Over to you, Tindai. Thanks so much, Kuda, and thanks so much, Leila, for convening this event, which I think really embodies the decolonial orientation at the center of, of the discussions that you've been having all day. Um, and I want to say a special thank you for the phenomenal co-panelists. I feel like I could just say I agree with what they both said and I would be done. Um, but maybe what I'll add is just some reflections from the domain of um, international law, because that's my field. And I would say that the questions that you put to us are really urgent and pressing questions for international law and for international um, lawyers. And indeed, I think they are challenging questions at a very fundamental level. So 
when we talk of decolonization in international law, international law triumphantly declares the successful decolonization of much of the world as a fait accompli. And so decolonization, which means the achievement of self-determination of all peoples through the nation state, at least in international law, um, the international legal orthodoxy is that this has been um, achieved. And, and as we on this in this workshop can, can likely all agree, that orthodoxy really belies the neocolonial and imperial circumstances of most nation states and their borders. But it also belies the coloniality of the nation state as the priority vehicle for collective self-determination, right? So if we're thinking about decolonial approaches and in international law, which focuses on the nation state, there's a way in which built into the frame is a coloniality that, that really has to be um, grappled with. In the context of migration, the very categorization of a person as a migrant, for example, and not as a refugee, will immediately strip them of internationally recognized claims to admission and inclusion. And even if the refugee category itself is applied to an individual, it's a category that reproduces racialized, gendered, and other injustices. And so in a non-trivial way, and others have noted this, international law is imperial law. And it's colonial rather than decolonial because of all of the ways that even today it reproduces domination and subordination along historical lines. And I'm thankful to both Aurora and Ipek who've highlighted the importance of, of history and of time when we're thinking about these questions of, of decolonization. And so I would say they're very difficult questions regarding whether decolonization in general is compatible with international law as we know it. And, and I would say that decolonization for international law, at least to my mind, is about the remaking of the international order and of remaking the structures of interconnection. It's a truly, truly um, massive project. And it's one that I think um, is, you know, daunting in many different ways. Um, that said, even if we're setting aside decolonization as a kind of destination or a goal, I think it's worthwhile and important that we think about um, a decolonial orientation or a decolonial praxis and to ask ourselves what might this um, look like in the context of international law. And I believe that in international law, it begins with something that to some fields may seem very basic, but in international law remains a battle that is being fought, which is exposing the coloniality of the status quo and of the categories and the concepts that are treated as not only neutral, but as just, you know, the category of refugee, which many international lawyers fight hard for, for example, is treated as a neutral and just category when it has deep problems that, are, that go to its very core. When we think about um, international borders, for example, and international law, you know, the borders of the nation state are supposed to be sacred because of the doctrine of, of nation state sovereignty, but it the challenge becomes revealing the history and the basis and the effect of these international um, borders to show how deeply embedded they are with histories of, of imperialism. Um, in my own work, um, Migrationist Decolonization and other pieces that I've written, I build on um, the tradition of third world approaches to international law. It's like a, a field of international law that, or an approach to international law that is really committed to unmasking these core doctrines of international law for the injustices that they uh, perpetrate. And I would say in terms of research agendas where international lawyers um, are concerned, it's the slow but really urgent work of just unmasking the status quo is deeply problematic because it's very rarely acknowledged. And so even, you know, Leila, you mentioned in your comments, we are in a period, I think, of greater engagement with pushes for, you know, decolonization, pushes for greater engagement with racial justice issues. I would say that many of those pushes um, international law remains impervious to them in, in many ways. And so there's urgent work to be done on that front. I think the final thing that I'll say on this is the urgency of cross-disciplinary work, you know, and oftentimes when I'm in conversations with people outside of, of law and there's this talk of interdisciplinarity, there's a lot of criticism of that concept because of all of the challenges that I think attend interdisciplinarity. But I would say there's even lower hanging fruit, just being in the same rooms as individuals who are taking different perspectives is absolutely urgent, especially for international um, uh, lawyers. And so I would say that cross-disciplinary work, the kind of 
work that is being done at ACMS, the kind of work that I think you're promoting in this workshop is, is absolutely urgent. Thanks a lot, Tendai, for that. Uh, I think we are, the other question I think which I'm going to bounce back to you is then um, the question of um, how this sort of translates into, into certain kinds of teaching practices. Um, if, if indeed some of these hierarchies emanate through the way that we engage as well, what are some of the sort of ways of, of, of conscientizing uh, students within the practices that we, 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 we deploy in terms of um, uh, uh, the teaching? Uh, and I think the question of polarization that you mentioned around the debates then becoming uh, sort of battlefields as it were, how do we make make this a safe space to engage in meaningful ways um particularly this divide of sort of north south there's always the dichotomies is all race and class and gender so how do we then try to work towards that um sort of solidarity as it were within a space such as a, a classroom so we don't necessarily sort of polarize uh, if that's perhaps the way of going about it perhaps not Yeah, over to you, Tendai. I think your okay, mic was on mute. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Kuda. So, you know, I'm I'm really curious to see to hear what um, Aurora and Ipek will will say um, to this question. I was thinking about it, and it strikes me that to embrace decolonization as a frame and as a praxis and even as a politics is to embrace deep discomfort, contestation, and arguably even the polarization that comes with it, including um, in the classroom, you know, to teach the reality of international law of migration, for example. So I teach in, in um, Los Angeles in the United States, but no matter where I was, the reality of teaching the international law of migration is to teach its history of privileging white migration, you know, and white nations at the expense of the rest of the world through doctrines and concepts that persist in the present day. So even if you were teaching the reality of South African immigration law, for example, it would be um, about teaching of their neocoloniality, of the neocoloniality of South African borders and the ways that the borders here as well reproduce, you know, racialized and gendered injustices. I think. These realities are deeply contested, this, they're uncomfortable, precisely because they challenge a status quo that has powerful um, beneficiaries. And so I say all of this to highlight the fact that I think decolonial pedagogy is, is difficult um, and painful work, and we should be ready for that difficulty and for that pain and for that um, discomfort. And, I don't think this means that we have to have classrooms that are hostile um, classrooms in which learning is impossible. I think quite the opposite, um, as, you, as your framing could have really sets up, I think we have to be invested in creating environments that are conducive for learning when the knowledge that we're imparting is per se um, contentious. Um, but I, I, I do think we have to be prepared for a measure of contestation and discomfort. And, you know, you didn't ask this question, but I think part of the work is also teaching our colleagues, even before we get to teaching um, our students. I feel like a lot of the work that I do as an academic is uh, picking up the pieces left behind by other colleagues who engage with students in ways that deny the realities that I think a decolonial approach um, pushes for. The only two other insights I would share here is that part of the work of making the classroom a safe space is about transforming the classroom, right? Transforming who teaches and transforming who is taught. Both of these things I think are absolutely urgent and I don't think you can have successful engagement around decolonization when the politics of who's teaching and who's in the room are far behind. And I think this is where the challenge is. The work that we are trying to do is not surface level. It really is about remaking fundamental structures in ways that mean that it's not just about what's on your syllabus, right? It's about who's in the room. And I think IPEC's comment about, you know, the structure of, of universities, the, the, the embeddedness of neoliberalism that very much reproduces the dynamics that we're talking about has to be at the center of the conversation, even as we're thinking about the subject matter of, of migration. 
Thanks a lot, Tinda. And I think Apec, would would you like to come in here because I feel okay. you've also been sort of involved in this uh, question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I uh, my uh, this one of my points just follows on from Tendai's uh, intervention. Um, I think uh, one of the issues about both research and teaching, and maybe even for policy, is that if we want to decolonize uh, this sort of migration, uh, the field of migration, I think we need a better understanding of race. Right? We need to study uh, uh, race. But uh, maybe I'm uh, sticking my head out here to be chopped off. But I think I see, at least it seems to be, there is a resistance from maybe some European scholars, including those in migration research, you know, that, there's, that they haven't typically been too keen to talk about uh, uh, race. And I think there is a kind of a political uh, background to this. You know, Europe constructs race as something that happens elsewhere, or it's in the US at best. Uh, you know, racial problems are there. Uh, we, we don't have a race, or even in US academia. So these sorts of um, constructions, I think, are very problematic. We do need to talk about race to go beyond uh, race. And I think this epistemological gap, this racial blindness, ignorance, and refusal to engage with the fields of race is uh, problematic. And uh, it does reproduce Eurocentric approaches uh, in migration uh, research. It is, of course, being questioned. Not everybody does this. You know, we have uh, Peo Hansen's book, Mabelin's book. There's lots of other interventions from colleagues. Also, Adrian Favard, for example, has a new book coming out on integration. But we need uh, many more of these. The other thing is the this, um, this idea that it connects with this race issue that I uh, raised. Typically, uh, diversity and migration, at least within Europe, so I'm based in the UK, remember, they are seen as something that happened to the global north recently. Right? That's the typical understanding. It's something that happened to the global north recently. This is because they ignore that cultural and racial plurality has been woven into the fabric of the global north due to colonialism and empire. Right, so uh, we are not diverse now. We were always diverse. Di empires have always been uh, uh, diverse, and um, and there's that quote, you know, um, uh, I think in one of Salman Rushdie's books, uh, he says, "Oh, British people don't know their history because much of it happened elsewhere." So it's kind of trying to say, actually, uh, you know, we were empires. Maybe I'll make one um, uh, uh, other point: uh, is that in terms of teaching and research is I'm, uh, I already raised the issue of this decolonizing and neoliberal university, the tensions uh, there. I think we need to think about them. Can we really decolonize uh, neoliberal and market-driven universities? Secondly, I think there is also a tension between diversity and decolonization. And the tension there I see is that uh, there's a risk that diversity drive will eat up the serious critique that decolonization can bring. So I think it would be interesting for us uh, kind of uh, to think about that, that, that it can kind of take the edge off. Tendai said we need to be uncomfortable. It kind of takes that uh, edge off, but then it, it kind of uh, erases the serious critique that decolonization can bring. And it can kind of, you know, lead to, you know, we're not going to create parallel canons. What we're trying to do is challenge epistemological biases and ignorance in the mainstream canon, right? We are trying to talk to the mainstream canon. Um, so I'll stop there. I have other topics to add, but I'm sure Aurora uh, would like to speak as well. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Thanks a lot, Impact, uh, for that. Uh, and I will now give the floor to Aurora to also have her uh, take on this uh, question. Thank you. Definitely, definitely. Thank you. I completely agree with Tendai's and Epic's comments, so I'm not going to uh, extend my answer much because I see that we are about to conclude. And I will only add that um, we could teach reflecting on the aspects of the research agendas and vision that we have proposed today, uh, considering the possibility of reconstructing the canons that we use to teach on most of those topics, these topics. And considering that you two already emphasized on this, I will bring as a teaching strategy um, or pedagogical idea 
that we need to um, make sure that students are confronted with the ideas of how a group is dehumanized. What are the narratives that are constantly used to construct a group as the other? The one when we are teaching in this field of knowledge is really important that we can help students to understand why dehumanization is a constant to build these communities and to see in justify the systematic killing of many populations across the globe. Most of the time when we are teaching, we teach students to read the literature, we teach students to comply with all of the norms and the rules of citations and building bibliographies and following the rules of methodology. And most of the time students when confronting with, with when they're confronted with how to explore narratives, how to use the narratives, how to change, challenge the narratives, they do not necessarily know how to face it. And considering the phenomena such as anti-Blackness, or this, all the situations that we are facing now, I am starting to think that if we move towards analyzing the conceptual, the material and empirical basis of dehumanization and helping students to move towards understanding how these narratives are constantly used, but at the same time, how do communities that are dehumanized, dehumanized how these communities constantly emphasize their humanity, how are these constants, constant processes of challenging these narratives coming into place? I think probably we can move forward into really creating a new cohort of uh, researchers that are going to help us to understand the complex tensions and uh, categorical and theoretical tensions that we are constantly facing in the field. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I have enjoyed very much it in sharing this space with Tendaji and Ipek to reflect on these issues. Thank you. Thanks so much also from my side. Um, we are already like, this is the theme of the day. We're all, always out of time today because these issues are so important and and they need much more space. Yeah. So of course we are aware that even in such a small round table, we cannot just even start to scratch on the surface, but still, um, I think it's an opportunity, as I said also in the morning, to plant some seeds and to start the discussion um, also across our universities, our university context, but also still, if you're okay with that, our three panelists, I still would open the floor for questions. I think we don't have to answer them all. Sometimes the questions in itself, they're very important because we can take them home. We can continue to reflect. So just to have them and then if you want to address them shortly at the final uh, statement, this would be wonderful. Um, I take the privilege as a moderator to also put one question in there who maybe one of you wants to answer. Um, maybe also Tenda, I know because you also dare to step into the policy world. So to say also to know a little bit about your reflections also, what are the pitfalls, but also opportunities to engage with the policy world. and to bring the agenda out from the university also inside the policy world would be I myself curious, but I will stop here to take more space and ask everybody in the audience if you have a question to pose it. And if so, just unmute yourself. Always tricky who wants to take the floor first. Yeah. If there is no one, we can also make a final reflection, but I still give us a couple of minutes. So if not, I would say I hand back um, the word to our panelists for a final round, maybe also in reflection on this policy world. So maybe I'll, I'll just um, jump in. And I think this question around how you shape the exchange between critical migration research on the, and the policy world and practitioners on the ground is among the hardest, if not the hardest that you um, have put to us. And I think it's because um, the policy world and the practitioner universe, to my mind, are the contexts that are the most entrenched and invest in the power hierarchies that a decolonial approach to migration is invested in remaking, you know, and I encounter this 
I think on a daily basis in the context of my work with the UN, you know, I, and I think back to negotiations around the global compact on migration in 2018, where, you know, trying to bring a decolonial approach to that negotiation um, process, I think feels akin to, you know, going to the greatest beneficiaries of a kind of neo-colonial imperial structures and asking them to give up those those benefits. Um, and this is not to say that everybody who's in the practitioner world or in the policy world necessarily is opposed to a decolonial approach, rather it's to say something about the structures and the context in which um, they're working. So I think a decolonial approach is especially different, difficult in those contexts. To an audience like this, I was thinking that one thing that is really urgent is is to continue to produce the knowledge that we're producing and to think about how that knowledge is a backdrop that can inform the priors of the people who become policymakers and, and practitioners, right? What kinds of educations structure the worlds and the ways that policymakers and practitioners go into the work that they're doing? And, you know, policymaking world and many of the people I think who are practitioners as when it comes to international migration, these are elite spaces and meaning these people are educated in elite contexts. And so I think the project of decolonizing academic spaces, decolonizing elite universities, I think is very closely tied to, to this particular question that, you're, that you raise. But I would say another thing is to do the work of connecting with policymakers and practitioners, you know, do lay, you know, pound the pavement, so to speak, so that conversations around critical migration scholars aren't just conversations around critical migration scholars, but that they bring in the individuals who you're seeking to influence. I personally feel like a lot of those conversations end up feeling like you're screaming into the void, which is actually wrong. You are not screaming into a void. Those, those spaces also involve human beings and a diverse set of actors who are actually, some of them who are actually really eager to re-understand the spaces that they're working in. But I think it requires the slow and painful work of, of networking, getting to know the individuals, and then creating the kinds of spaces where you can have those kinds of dialogue. It's not going to happen overnight, and it requires deep investments of, of resources. And I think some of the initiatives that ACMS has taken on, for example, really kind of speak to this. Um, so, so no magic bullet on my side, but just reflections that highlight the need for transformation of pedagogy, but then also for doing the hard work of building relationships with the individuals who are in policy making and practitioner spaces as well. Um, but thank you so much for including me in this conversation. It's been such a, a pleasure. So yeah, Aurora, thanks. Shall I go next? Yes, yes, we can do. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much uh, uh, for those thoughts, Arant and I. Um, I suppose I, uh, I just want to think about you know um, preaching to the converted, but then also thinking about you know people who take a cynical view about decolonization. Remember, there were those sorts of um, approaches also to gender, right? Gendering disciplines and so on. So those of you who are as old as me will remember this uh, from <laughs> a couple of decades ago. Now, what I want to say is that both in research policy and teaching, I think we need to highlight that we want to dec decolonize because a decolonized curricula and research will not only deliver a more socially just world, so that's the kind of moral ethical bit, but without it, research and curricula cannot be accurate, robust, or rigorous. Right? Research and curricula, which ignores and erases others willfully or inadvertently, reproduces racial hierarchies, knowingly or unknowingly, or universalizes from the experiences of only some groups, or is ignorant about his racial prejudices, it cannot claim to be producing global or rigorous knowledge, um, including teaching material. So such knowledge will always remain partial, inaccurate, and defective. And I think I'm kind of putting together a manifesto for uh, SARS, uh, the uh, Center for Ethnicity and Racism Studies. So I kind of um, wanted to also appeal to people who are kind of beyond our disciplines or, or people who haven't thought about this. But I think this aspect of why we need to decolonize, because we want better research, because we don't want erasure and we don't want 
uh, um, uh, hierarchies reproduced in our research. And because we can then create more rigorous and more global knowledge, I think that's quite an important um, thing to think about. And that's how we should also approach this in terms of our students and our, in terms of our research, but also policy, right? Um, so I think I'm repeating myself now, so I'll mute myself. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ipek. And so I hand the word over to Aurora. Yeah, thank you. I just had one line to add. It's just in this COVID-19 context, we can definitely see this applying. And when we take a very close look at uh, what the narratives use um, pertaining the bans on South Africa and the new COVID variant, you can see this happening. And we definitely have to take these lessons to consider how this is applying to this new framework. That's the only thing I would like to add. Thank you. Thank you so, so much to all the three of you. And I think it's also a very nice note to end on, like at one hand to create discomfort, like Tenda said, but on the other hand, as you also said, um, building relationship of trust, engaging, and also with the aim to be then, as uh, you also said now, in fact, to be more analytical, more rigorous, right? Um, so I think that's also a very positive note. Um, to end on, and I really want to thank all of you um, for your time um, and your engagement with us that we we can learn and and yeah grow from each other from these exchanges. Thanks so much on on also on the behalf of Kuda and and all the participants and have a wonderful afternoon or in our case a wonderful evening. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. You so Enjoy your weekend. A pleasure to see you again, Tentai. Take care. Bye, bye. Thank you very much for organizing. And Hava, I uh, replied to you. It's in my new uh, forthcoming book. Thank you.